First of all, I would like to say a big thanks for you coming. And honestly, for me, this screening and the Saturday screening are very important. You know, we started uh, the Film Factory three years ago here, and we are leaving soon. And uh, the Saturday screening will be the last. But we can share it with you. And I just wanted to tell you one thing. First of all, really big thanks for all your support, for your sympathy, your warmth. And the other thing what I really want to say, I'm proud today <coughs> two legendary guys are in Sarajevo. First, I would like to introduce uh, our friend Api Chapong. He came from Thailand. From Paris. He is <laughs> Because his name is started with A. <laughs> and we are following the ABC. And the second is Carlos. <laughs> Honestly, I'm very proud. They give me their friendship. And I hope they got mine. Sure. And today it will be a big uh, film historical event when the Q&A, the moderator of this Q&A will be Abhi <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for being here and for your applause. I'm, I'm very happy uh, about being here. This is the third time I come to um, the, Acad um, the factory, the film factory. It's my sixth time in Sarajevo, so that means I certainly like the place. Um, I met uh, Api Chalpong for the first time ever here in 2002 or three with uh, my first film. I think it was his second. And I'm very happy to see him again. Thanks to Bella and the Film Factory, and I thank you very much for being here. And of course, you have my friendship, and I feel very proud of having yours. Both of you. Thank you. Uh, it's a real honor. The honor is mine. Uh, it's my second time here for the Film Factory with a new set of students. And I'm really touched by Bella's dedication to the school and to the cinema community here. And right, Carlos said that we met here in the film festival in Sarajevo. And at that time he said, um, I'm not sure if I continue making movies because you're working on many other projects. And I, I'm sure that he will, and I, I'm right, yeah. And he said the same, and Bella said the same, oh, I'm not making more movies, but see in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> anyway, now let's talk later after the film. Thank you very much. I think it's a movie that is hard to talk about, but it's not a movie that is difficult to watch for me. You know, you can throw any image to me and I'll be okay. Because it's such a, it, it for me is a kinetic thing and at the same time, I've been there in, in your house, so I look at it as a, kind of like a home movie. Also, the labor of love. You, you shot this movie after the house finished or during the making? It was just finished. Just finished? Yeah, we're finishing, still certain things. Yeah, because you, you've been building this house by hand, by yourself. Yes, that's true. And it's almost like make, you're making a movie as 
as part of the process, like continue with the building, you know, now it's cinema after this architecture. So it's, uh, it's uh, almost like you need a movie to complete this house. I mean, it's true. <laughs> and it's so beautiful. I mean, it's your, it's your house and it's your dogs, your kids, no? Yeah, true. So for me, I, I have been there, so I, I know this background. And I had uh, ride on this road, so it's it's a very emotional for me that that oh you can do this that that something so personal, but at the same time can share with the audience. Yeah. So I don't know. That's my impression. I can tell you that um, even though it, you're right, it is my house, uh, my children, my dogs, um, and as you say, it's so personal. But at the same time, I can tell you that it's it's complete fiction, and most particularly the two main characters, uh, what they go through, how they experience uh, life, uh, is something more of a, an observation of my own, of other things, rather than myself. I, I, I mean, they are not, it's not autobiographical in that sense. Um, for me, uh, the film is uh, about many things, but one of them is uh, some sort of insatisfaction, um, a lack of, of, you know, calmness and uh, just pl plenitude, you know, the, uh, of the joy of life. And um, in a way, it could be like a metaphor for uh, Western life in the sense of being rich and having everything, uh, not only material, but also like company, friends, a family, a house, uh, and still be unsatisfied. So in that sense, I mean, and you come from the East, maybe you know what I'm talking about, but I'm talking about this like uh, internal, deep internal unsatisfaction, um, even though you have everything external possible including uh, companionship, family, things people long for and think will necessarily, necessarily bring uh, peace and they don't necessarily do it just by, their, by themselves. Mm. But there, there were also fragments of reality, no? Or at least, let's say, the football, is that, you know, what you mm. went to school? Also the, the party, maybe? If I have to guess, yes, the the, the two parties, like the din, like the Christmas uh, dinner, you, you mean that? Uh, yes. And also when they go to the village and they also have like a dinner with the people from the village, mm -hmm. those two are like real situations, uh, but they're, they're not real. Then I actually no, I, we organized those dinners or whatever you want to call them, yeah. gatherings, and then we shot randomly. There were several cameras shooting, mm -hmm. like three cameramen each time. So I wasn't controlling the whole situation, and it was happening. And as, of course, the rugby and um, yes, but even the rugby, you know, I organized the match and uh, we organized the, you know, the clothing, red and blue, uh, navy blue, and um, it's it's this mix between uh, well, you know, a lot about that, but a mix of uh, documentary material captured, transformed building something with it, keeping some of the uh, some of the unexpected, and then also mostly what you have prepared. A, a mixture of all that together. What about this? I think everyone is curious about this sauna orgy thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> let me just... That's let, also reality. Let me just think for a minute. Yeah, that's, that's what? Did you that's say? Part of the reality. Part of the yeah, uh, reality, uh, yes. I was uh, precisely at the factory today or yesterday, I don't remember well, we were talking about what reality is. Mm -hmm. And I insisted on the fact that reality is not concrete, present, conscious reality, but also, and, or even you could say mostly, um, memories, uh, desires, uh, projections of the future, um, and, and dreams and many more, many other things. You know, for the dream, the devil at the beginning, for me that's a dream. Uh, 
and, and that is not unreal, or, or, or some people even ask me if I had gone to the realm of the fantastic, but it's not, it's reality, because reality is also those things. Those images you see of the future, for example, uh, are part of reality. It's the, the images we have of the future, and then the future might not come true. Usually, do I mean, very often it doesn't, but they are real images the moment we're experiencing them. Mm. Um, yeah, well, in, 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 in the school or in the factory, we talked about how you can probably have uh, an image of uh, me going back to Mexico in two days. And I would need that so I could go. You need to project the future. and Or me thinking of reuniting with my, uh, uh, my children in three days. Mm -hmm. And if you could see my, the images I'm looking at now, probably they are, they are real images. Let's say we could connect them to a computer where you could see what I see with my inner thoughts. Mm -hmm. And that probably touches, uh, we've been discussing with Bella a bit uh, about your idea of uh, seeing cinema with closed eyes. I mean, you know better than me about that. But I, I think I know what you're talking about there when, when it's all about this, you know, it, just projections of the future. You don't see them, but they can be part of the film. Mm. And the use of this distortion, the lens, with has a double on the edges, is that part of the... I don't know, the play with reality or to remind you that... No, not necessarily, you know, I think that's a, that's a code. Usually, uh, if images are blurry or uh, undefined, uh, traditionally, in uh, the audiovisuals, you can think of that as a code of, of something oniricolored, or, or you know, dreamlike. Um, but I, I don't think it's that, because I also have used uh, like transformation of images in, in other senses, in other films. And it's just that I think uh, things shouldn't be too clear. Uh, like very defined images, I think, uh, are assaulting us. And they kidnap you uh, while you watch them. They become everything. They take all your attention. And then, even though they are so powerful while you watch them, the rest of the senses are diminished, the sense of hearing, the sense of touch, and therefore those images do not remain in your memory in the same way as diffuse images can stay inside. Mm. So I think uh, to see things as, as they are meant to be, we already have our own eyes. And if we make a film, we might as well transform those images, just reinterpret what we actually see. Um, and the same applies for this choice of framing of the not not uh, traditional <laughs> widescreen or mm. one eight five. Well, to a large extent, yes. Uh, of course, I mean, there's like a traditional answer that I could give you that the mountains at this place are very narrow and very tall, mm. so it would be hard to frame like in landscapes that are more horizontal. But uh, apart from that, I did think a lot that goes together with the blurriness of the sides because I wanted something that would have a lot of volume. Uh, so, uh, you know, like uh, a deep uh, sort of sense sensitivity, like a, like a 3D kind of thing, but not, not only in 2D, but like, uh, yeah, volume, you know what you call volume, at least in the Latin sense of volume. I wanted a lot of definition in the center and then the rest not defined. And I did find that that would give uh, something like very, um, some sort of immanence to the images, you know? Like, if you f shoot with this almost a square format, uh, a glass of water or a dog, and he's in the center of the frame, and something that can come forward from it, and then you can feel uh, how much everything is alive or can, is truly alive, you know? Not only a flower, but also a shoe or the knob of a door, you know. Uh, I, I wanted to give that quality to things mm -hmm. and not just have things as um, tools so a story could be told, but rather to understand and, and realize that everything is alive. Mm -hmm. I mean, material objects as well. For me, I, I feel like it's a keep reminding me of the large format camera mm -hmm. framing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yeah, and anyway, how, how do you enjoy making this film? Because it's such a intimate space, mm -hmm. and I, I just try to picture the working process, the script. Well, actually, the, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
No, I was thinking, I was thinking about the enjoyment of making the film. I've always had the luck of really enjoying uh, making films. Mm. All the processes, writing, uh, finding the places, finding the people, to the last bits of uh, sound correction, or even making the credits. Mm. Uh, but this film was uh, for everyone that has had children here. Uh, you know, that's always a very stressful period in life, uh, especially the first two or three years. And there were two ch children there. And we slept, and eventually we finished at, late at night, and we slept, and we wake, woke up, and the camera was there next to us on, on, by the bed on a tripod still. So yeah, that was hard. It was hard working with the children, because if they didn't have their siesta in time, then they wouldn't do it. And uh, it was worse than working like with Sofia Loren and some other diva, you know. <laughs> and if a child says no, at least an adult you can offer him money or something. <laughs> but a child, there's no way you can go around uh, no. So uh, eventually there were certain things that we had to do in the morning, but then the weather was bad, so I was very anxious about uh, the fact that in the afternoon I knew that wouldn't work. And people told me, like, don't worry, that, that will work. But I knew it wouldn't work, and that happened. The afternoon, we had great, uh, great light, but the, the children wouldn't do anything in the afternoon just because they couldn't be bothered. And they, were, and they hadn't had a good siesta, and in siesta time, we had to be very quiet. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was, that was difficult. But uh, apart from that, I did enjoy a lot. I have to tell you, for example, for the sauna, when we went to Mexico City, and we did that as if it was Paris, but it's Mexico City, um, I enjoyed it so much. And I was there just in a steam bath with no interference from the outer world. There was no problems with weather. There weren't any children around, no animals around, all these things Hitchcock said you shouldn't do films with. And we were just there and I, could, I, I remember just thinking how easy and how pleasurable it is to make a film. You put the camera where you want, you tell the adults what they have to do, they do it, and you can carry on. But in, in, in the house it was like always trying to find it and like a, more like a documentary with animals you know mm -hmm. where you never know what's going to happen mm. no i feel like if, if your kid you know more grown up and watch this film it's almost like a gift you know to, to them or it's like album <laughs> sure and sure i do feel that too i have to admit mm. yeah we I, i'm doing a new film now and during the film again yeah. now there's six and eight and uh it has been lovely and that will be beautiful too but I think now, now they have their own consciousness and their own taste and their own ideas, mm. and uh, I think that will be the last. They will not want one anymore. They will not want another film ever around them, uh, which is great because I think every almost every job. Uh, no, not almost. I think every job in life is wonderful, but acting is probably the only one I wouldn't suggest to my children. And now they have been vaccinated. They don't want to be near a camera ever again. Okay. You never know. But... No, you never know. No, you never know. How scripted were the children's performances? How much did you have in the script, and how much did you improvise, and how did you go about directing them? You wouldn't believe it, but uh, they are basically fully uh, uh, scripted. Um, I brought a, a book uh, where my screenplays are, and if you see them, I mean my storyboards, you would see that they are <laughs> completely prepared. Um, even when he comes, like the little boy comes into the room and he throws his, uh, what do you call him? His, his diaper, yeah. You, you remember that? It looks like really natural, but he did it like three times or four times, or four takes, and every time he threw the diaper. And that goes for him, who was three years old, and, and, and uh, the Ruth uh, was 18 months old. And, for example, when we did the beginning and she had to say cows and all this and follow the camera, she did it as I asked her to. And basically all of the dialogues they say, uh, we managed to make them say them. Uh, it's all scripted, basically. How did you manage to make them do all of it? A lot of the theme or...? Well, firstly, I think it's, I don't want to like tell you how to educate children or anything, <laughs> but uh, I think it's pretty much about treating children as, 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 as individuals, not as, as dumb babies, you know, which is what so many people do. So I asked them to do the things and they knew, they could understand. And even Eliasar, the boy, uh, helped me with his sister at certain points, and I asked him to help me and he would talk with her. And, and, and yeah, I don't know, I don't know how it happens, to be honest. But basically I just told them what I wanted and what was needed and they, they cooperated. 
What about the new film that you're making with them? Are they that was harder. harder no? <laughs> with them, that was harder because now, of course, they have their own taste, and there's moments when they want to play, and uh, they don't want to take my my directions, you know. So uh, um, eventually, this time it was like I will only do it twice, Dad. So you better get it right the first time. And then there was a need for a third, and it was very difficult. We had to go apart and talk again, as if you were working with a huge diva. Really, <laughs> but it was but it was very nice, very pleasurable, and I love being near my family. So that's why I do films with them too. That's one of the reasons. Well, the main reason probably. Can you share a bit about the new film or no? Mm, to be honest, not much, but not because uh, I am like I don't think that's bad luck or anything. But usually, I just think that that making a film requires so much energy that if you start talking about it, it like you. you you ruin uh, part of your engine, don't you? Does it happen to you? That's no, why. I, I always don't. Oh, you do? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, it's one of us. It's different then. I personally like I, uh, you know, like all the, for example, pitching or talking with a producer about it, and uh, or just sharing with other people like the the, the screenplay, what things go are gonna happen. All that for me is like can, it can kill my my need to make the film. So, uh, I mean, yeah, basically I can tell you that it's a love uh, story of a family that live in the countryside in a bullfighting state. Mm -hmm. And they raise bulls, and the guy's a poet. And, uh, and they have to some trouble, but also some beautiful moments, and they're struggling. I've got a question about Neil Young's song. You have rights or...? <clears throat> yeah, you know, with uh, th uh, things uh, that relate to Canada and the US, you better have rights. Otherwise, uh, yeah, I, I did write directly to Neil Young because I knew if I went through his agents, they would try to get all the money out of my pocket. So I wrote directly to him. I found his, uh, the, his address somewhere and, and he was very generous and I think he said, just uh, give us a thousand dollars so everything is clear. Clear and, and that's it. Probably when he saw the way she sings it, she, he must have been quite angry, but... <laughs> <laughs> but he was very generous before. <laughs> I wanted her to sing like that, you know. I mean, she's not a great singer, of course, as you can see here. But that was the charm of the thing, you know. She doesn't play the piano great or doesn't sing great, but that wasn't the, there wasn't any pretension there. Like, I wanted something very homely, you know, very natural. It's a beautiful song, don't you think? It is. It's a beautiful performance, especially in that context. Especially in the what? In that context. Yes, yes, I like it. You know, I mean, it's very touching when he starts singing along with her, so terribly, uh, and and that is also. I mean, I find that very very touching. This might be a banal question, but I was just curious if you can tell me more about the uh, cats appearing at the end instead of dogs. I think it was <laughs> Cat, the cats appearing at the end instead of dogs. Yeah, in the, in the scene where Seven comes back to the house. Yeah, and there's a cat around. around. Yeah, yeah, you're right. There's two cats. Yeah. Two cats, really. I've seen it before, so I thought maybe there was something. <laughs> no, no. It's just there's cats and dogs around there. Uh, but probably, you know, uh, the, one of the dogs, uh, I, mean, apparently, I mean, in the film, two of the dogs are killed, uh, I think, when the, there's a robbery, so probably there's meant to be only one dog at the end. So probably I, I noticed the cats were around, and I thought that was better, because that would make a point uh, uh, on the absence of the dogs. Basically, maybe, yeah, that, that was probably the reason. Let's go back to the process of making films. So, for example, you have some, um, in the beginning, the idea. For example, you have that idea of the insatisfaction with the uh, life, for example, the sharp division between the world of the grown-ups of the society and the nature and the world of kids. Then, for example, you have uh, the ideas of the class differentiation in Mexico and all those subtle, the way we experience the world and the technique we use, for example, to uh, make it um, good, then, for example, you try to um, put it into the, in, in the scripts and to imagine all those scenes and the story and things like that. So I'm interested to um, what extent uh, do you control the process I, I will answer uh, that with a sort of paradox. I would tell you that uh, the film is made basically throughout pure intuition with very little uh, 
contrast with reason. Uh, but at the same time, everything is fully controlled. But I want, to, if you want me to explain that uh, further, I would tell you that um, I just wanted to, to create that world and tell that story where uh, I remember the basic idea was a man that, I, I mean, I suppose many of you have read, I'll, I'll tell you something. Uh, uh, many of you must have read um, War and Peace by Tolstoy. And you must remember, you have. Do you remember Princess Bol Bolkonski? Uh, of course, the, one of the main characters. Uh, remember he, well, he had everything. He was a good officer in the army, he was beautiful, he was from a good family, whatever, he had everything he wanted. Uh, but I remember that he was, uh, yeah, he wasn't a very happy person. But when he died, when he's about to die, uh, on the fields, I think there's a grenade that lands near him, and he's about to die uh, near uh, the brush, you know, there, the bushes. And uh, he had that feeling of uh, plenitude for a second. I just remembered that very well. It was very touching to me when I read that. So I, I had like sort of that idea behind. And a few other ideas here and there, you know, and uh, that was it. I didn't want to make a film about insatisfaction, as I just said. Uh, that came only afterwards. It was only the intuition, but of course when I was choosing the characters, for example, the, 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 the people that play the roles, I, I, I saw some more luminous people. And then I thought, no, I want them more like that, like the ones here in the film, that are pretty... Uh, I mean, I don't want to be like, say negative things about them, but what's the word? Mediocre is like um, too negative, but just very standard, you know? They're not very passionate people. Though they're actually quite dull uh, in different ways. And all that, I just felt it while I was preparing the film. So everything mechanically is very prepared, the shots, how they're dressed, what's happening, but all the rest of the decisions are just taken by, taken by intuition. And once the film is finished, I see what it is about. I really, uh, uh, my wife was the editor of this film and, the, and my previous film also. Um, she said to me that I've been talking to the people in the factory about being authentic and, and honest. And she says, because she's also a filmmaker and she's going to do a film soon, that that can be uh, very difficult to define at a certain point. Because she says that to be honest in the sense or authentic, you need to be, have a lot of self-confidence too. And that's not so easy. So it, that, therefore it's not so easy to be honest, even though you could want to be honest. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is that I try to do the film as it is without really knowing exactly what it is about. And in Q&As and, and, and interviews afterwards, I learn a lot about what I have done and why. I really don't need to know. And I didn't know much. And I don't know why the, of course now I know why the rugby was there, but when I wrote it, I didn't know. I wrote the whole film in two days, uh, in automatic uh, writing, almost. But I'm not like saying it just came out of the blue like that. I, I did feel the film for a year or so, S but certain things. But I didn't know what would happen. I don't know what the film is about. I never think like big uh, concepts, like I'm going to do a film about solitude, for example, or insatisfaction. Uh, no, I want to do a film about a family and uh, you know, have that thing in the persona, have a few things here and there, certain central engines, like maybe uh, that little tree song about, uh, from Siete, that uh, the betrayal, but also that could be justified within a whole thing. And you know, for example, the class difference, I never thought, I have never thought of making a point of class differences in Mexico. I, I just have a duty of being loyal to reality, and that happens to be the reality there. So I just want to be, I just want to be loyal to that. Happy. Mm. <laughs> um, how do you feel, uh, because you are so different from, because you know, let, just let me give you a little digression. Uh, me being a Mexican, uh, I am, uh, in the end, well, Mexico was made by the, uh, by the European conquest, of course, or destruction of the American uh, indigenous people. So we are we are really Westerners in our thoughts. Some uh, uh, some of the Mexicans maybe half, uh, and you are different. But I also think a lot of, of those things like the dreams and the things that are not physically present uh, in front of us and these pro projections of the future and all that. How do you feel about that when you see a, 
a film like this? Do you feel it's like, uh, how do you feel about those things? No, I, I, I have particular uh, fondness of Mexico. I went there, of course I have gallery there, and, and somehow the people and uh, the relationship with spirit and death in particular is really striking. And somehow, of course, I cannot help you know compare with my my background. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I just feel a, a little part of home <coughs> in there, or, or even memory, you know, and and the green, you know. So I don't know. I, I feel so uh, I don't know at ease with mm -hmm. this, and feel that it's not foreign. It's not you know. It's, mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> but if you would think of a, a European film and then mostly what you do, this would be something a little in between, uh, or more Western or more or closer to what you. What do you mean? Uh, uh, this kind of yeah, the feelings you when you see a film like this, mm. do you feel like a, a Western film or not? Not really. Or I mean, maybe that doesn't that concept is absurd. I know a Western film. I mean, I don't know. I just no, no, it's your film. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, 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 I know. But even people in Mexico tell me, oh, you do this European cinema, and I, really, I also don't understand exactly what that is. But... Oh, I know what you mean. Even now. in Mexico, they <laughs> tell me that. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't listen, it's it, it just... Just classification, absurd classification. Yes, yes, and yeah. But by the way, I love the headless Man, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I don't. How did you do that? I mean, <laughs> the head is okay, you can yeah. make, but he lays really still. Yes. With the red, it's really non-moving thing. Like. Yes. But that's the man there. Yes. No, but it's a very pertinent question because I, I precisely again at the factory, I've been telling them that we tend to think like, oh, we do it in digital. And that really doesn't mean anything, you know, you have to think how to do it. You know, you've made some uh, visual effects too, and you have to think about how, how you get around them. Basically there, uh, well, he falls on the ground, and as you say, he would have breathe, mm. and therefore he would move. So we did ro rotoscope uh, him to separate him so we would fix him, <laughs> and so the body wouldn't move. Ah, rotoscope. Uh, yeah, yeah, for him, but I remember also the, the head, when it comes apart, I remember the visual effects guys that wanted to do the blood like with a liquid, uh, to, uh, like a program to make liquid, and I thought that was uh, absurd. And I remember that I said, just in case, let's have that hose that we had with a tank that we would pressure on, on, on red water, you know, uh, where water painted red, and, and, and it just came up and down, and they, and they said that's useless, and then they, in the end that was better, you know. I mean, some real things, are so much better than programs to make liquid, you know? And so we had this water, and we filmed it right there, like holding the hose like that with the hands, but against the sky. So that was easy to rotoscopy as well. So all the blood coming off from his veins is really coming off a hose. I think the most, maybe, pressurable film to make are those horror films. No, it, it maybe looks scary to the audience, but the making of it is, is fun. I think they have a lot of fun <laughs> with people doing those things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's much more difficult. You have less fun like observing little things. Huh? Mm. Uh, yeah, it's sometimes harder. After all these questions about decisions and technique, and you're letting us know that your choices are purposeful, um, can you tell us what the film is about and what you are about? And can you tell us what is this intellectual itch that you're trying to scratch in these films? Where do you start? What bothers you as a filmmaker? What, the question why? is why, yeah. Why, make that, why what is make this such about? A film? Yeah. If you answer any of them, you will answer all of them. Exactly. I have thought of that, of course, many times. I mean, why bother doing this? Um, and the only, uh, as I told you, I only learn afterwards. So when I have to ask myself those questions or when I'm asked, I don't think of those things beforehand. Uh, but I think it's... Uh, and I would love to know why, why Bella or Api Chatbun do things too. But for me, I, I have really tried to solve that uh, mystery. Uh, and the mystery of why. And it's basically because I want to share. 
something with others. Not even communicate anything in particular. I'm not communica communicating anything in particular. That would be like doing propaganda or advertisement. I'm not trying to communicate any particular idea to uh, any of you. Uh, but I want to share, I probably, you know, probably it's exactly for the same reason for which you would say, if I ask you, why do you talk to the person, to your friend when you're walking by on the, on the street? Why do you tell her or him, look at the sky? Or see that tree, it's so beautiful. Mm. Or uh, I don't know, whatever, it's cold. Why do you say to someone it's cold? She knows it's cold, and you know it's cold. And why do you say it's cold? Well, I'm, I'm cold, I'm freezing. Because we all belong to the same species, and it happens that we are uh, gregarious, and uh, we need each other to see, to see ourselves in the mirrors who we all are for each other, I suppose. That sounds like uh, abstract, or I don't know, but it's, 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 it's essential, that, that is the reason. And what am I communicating, or what, why am I, it's not even, a, some people say it's communication, but it's not communication. Uh, some people say it's expression, uh, but I, for me it's not even expression, because I'm not, one, I, I'm not expressing myself. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm responding to a need to uh, see others, <laughs> or to see myself and just to share, it, it's, it's sharing, really. Really, that's why probably I hate so much uh, what, I, what I call uh, unilateral cinema, which is basically all of what we call Hollywood, which is not only produced in Hollywood, but all over the world, which is the cinema that tells you what to think, what to feel at every single moment, and doesn't leave space, any space for you as a viewer. Uh, there, someone is pressing on the buttons all the time, telling you exactly how to feel, and I don't, I don't like that. I, 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 I get really bored, and I, I, that's, I find that annoying. I want something to be presented. I believe very, very much in the idea of presentation, rather than representation, or of course entertainment. I want to present certain things that I have felt, which are not very clear, and share them with others. That's, that's, that's what it's all about. And then once something is presented, then what I feel or what, what this is all about is really irrelevant. People think that that's like a, the, the filmmaker being a little of a clown, you know? Like, what is this? Oh, what you want? Not, not what I think. But no, no, and people ask me, no, but what do you really think? And people think like I'm keeping the secret, you know? And the truth is that what I really think is really, really irrelevant. No, not irrelevant. It's, it, it is as relevant as any of your uh, uh, any of, uh, uh, of uh, as any of yours opinion. Can you say that? No, as the opi opinion of any of you, uh, it's as relevant as that. You know, it's like some guy does something, and then people think, uh, or, or uh, uh, yeah, let's say psychologists try to say why did he do this or that. You know, he robbed the bank, and why did he do it? And you try to make uh, a thesis or a theory rather on why he did this. And then you probably are there at the bench of the uh, accused, and you think, no, that guy is saying some nonsense, but then another guy says something, and you think, yeah, that's true, and I hadn't even thought of that. But he's really giving some good arguments, some good thinking of, of the reasons behind. I believe in this intuition that doesn't have to check with reason what it is doing. I think when reason is there in front of, of, of the carriage, then, Sorry for the guys in the, in the factory, but I said this a few days ago. Reason is the objective way of communicating among us. It's the, the neutral ground. It is the, the minimal common denominator. Uh, so I don't want any of that. I want to leave reason be, behind. Uh, what I want is to bring uh, the individual forward. So that individual subjectively is exposed so he can share himself with others. Like you could see into somebody else's soul or brain if you want, or images or feelings. That's, that's what I try to do. Like I would let you connect uh, a, a device so you, can, you could see inside me, and me too, because I don't, I don't see it inside me so clearly, of course. Then later maybe we could record it and I could see it as well, I would be interested. Some people think that's boring and that's uh, what's the whole point of showing someone, but I, I think that's, that's wonderful, just to share who we are and what we feel and how we think. 
and that has to be again uh, not very well defined because in the end you know nothing is really defined life is and will always be until the end of life uh, of the world uh, mysterious we'll never know exactly what it's all about what it is all about I think that's the kind of good ending for tonight we don't know what it's all about <laughs> We don't need to know. Uh, but we don't know, but we don't yeah. need to know. That's a terrible thing. They need to know. Yeah. Knowing is something else. It's, it's not. People we tend to think that if we, if by reason we understand, then we know, and that's a terrible mistake. Knowing is not reasoning, sort of something. It's only thinking. You know. I think whatever make us our heart beats a little faster, <laughs> make our curiosity peak and that's worth it yeah so thank you for this dream